Hey, everyone. Super exciting guest today and conversation around the future of cloud security, cloud data management, and more with the CEO of Panzora. Dan, how are you? Doing well, Evan. Well, thanks for being here. You're in beautiful Greenville, South Carolina, beautiful part of the country. Before we dive into uh, our topic today, maybe introduce yourself. And for those folks who haven't heard of Penzora, tell us about your mission. Yeah, thanks, Evan. So uh, I'm, uh, of course, Dan Waltzman, as you mentioned here, uh, uh, the CEO of Panzura. We're the uh, undisputed first choice for hybrid multi-cloud data management. I don't I don't know if you could get a bigger mouthful than that, Evan, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the ground we've staked out. And uh, uh, we're an exciting place where we're helping organizations especially large ones that are managing that move in and out of the cloud, uh, needing the fastest and most secure path uh, to move their data. Uh, you know, that's the sort of, that's the space that we own. Well, such an exciting topic, such a timely topic as really everyone is moving to the cloud and storage in the cloud for so many obvious reasons. So we understand the upside. What are some of the challenges, the pitfalls that companies, CTOs, CIOs need to be aware of as they make this pretty fundamental transition? So you mentioned to me when we were chatting or over over uh, commenting before we to schedule this was cost. Cost is a big mm. one. And we can certainly come back to that. But, you know, like any new emerging capability, whether now it's AI and pretty soon it'll be quantum. Um, the cloud, cloud itself it has costs and it's not simple. The costs are not simple. They're, they're, they're actually, you almost have to have a dedicated cloud mathematician to, to anticipate what your cloud costs are going to be. Uh, so cost is one. Security is a big one. If you if you manage to pay for all the right services, then you still have the possibility to have your data in, in, interdicted, uh, intercepted, uh, copied, shared, held ransom, all kinds of bad actors uh, trying to do things with your data. And so security is a big one. And then third, I think, is just getting the result that you want. Um, mm. We know that a significant number of workloads are being repatriated from the cloud back down to on-prem simply because... Whoever was making the decision to move the data might not have considered speed or, or security or user functionality. And now all of a sudden, what you thought was going to be a great breakthrough for your organization actually turns into a whole bunch of open tickets that are hitting the support department. Yeah, that, that is no fun. Been there, done that. Um, talk about some, some effective strategies that you've seen with your customers uh, to, to manage those cloud storage costs, um, particularly at the enterprise level, like give us some tips and tricks and insights. You must have seen it all. Yeah. So, well, uh, we're seeing a lot of it. I don't know that I've, I've seen it all, Evan, but uh, <laughs> certainly a few a few lessons learned. There's four or five strategies where technology can now help you manage some of these things. You don't have to do it on a spreadsheet or in the back of a napkin. One is automated data tiering and lifecycle management. There's more DLM capabilities available from the cloud or just as standalone mm. software providers. If you're not using machine learning algorithms to automate the process of data tiering, then, then the, your costs are going to be inflated, right? This is, this is about dynamically moving data between different storage tiers in clouds uh, and across clouds. Uh, to reduce uh, your cost basis on use basis on usage patterns, right? So one is automated data tiering. This falls under the data lifecycle management. Another thing that you could would consider and should consider is serverless computing integration, mm. right? Can you have a, a cloud utilization model that does not require physical servers? You can use hybrid cloud storage. And you only play, only paying for the compute time. Of course, the genius behind the cloud is now you're integrated into a service that doesn't need a server. And so, of course, you're sort of vendor lock-in into the cloud. It's good for both the organization and it's great for the cloud. So think about how you can have a serverless computing model. 
How about uh, AI-driven storage optimization is the third mm. sort of trend we're seeing right now. You can leverage the current AI capabilities that are out there to optimize storage allocation and performance. These are capabilities that you can consider before you're even moving that first workload into the cloud is using AI to, to, to help uh, you make decisions on where you should place data. And I think number four would be somewhere around the line of <clears throat> somewhere along the lines of multi-cloud management platforms. So mm. we used to talk about hybrid cloud, Evan, and every discussion was what should be on-prem, what should be in the cloud. And it feels like a lot of our conversations now are around, okay, we're going to go to the cloud for most of these things. Which cloud? And so mm. the conversation is really hybrid, hybrid multi-cloud is really where it's at now. And this is just a unified view and control over different platforms and allows you to allocate workloads to specific clouds that, are, that are, have the best capability or return on investment for the spend. The best example of this might be just the current AI landscape. You know, Bing funded $10, $11 billion worth of innovation with OpenAI. Of course, they seem to have uh, a head start with their Office 365 integration with Copilot. And so mm. you might choose to put your AI workloads right alongside your Word documents inside Azure. And you mm. might decide to have some really snazzy um, uh, you know, database management inside Oracle's cloud. And then you might mm. use Amazon for everything else because they're everywhere and they do all things. And so mm. you might want all three and you want them to work together seamlessly. And you don't want your databases on Amazon, uh, but, and you don't want your AI and Oracle, but you <laughs> want all the data to be talking to each other. And so if you can manage that right, if you can be thinking about that right, you stand to, to, to gain from uh, your utilization of cloud. Wow, my head is spinning. That is pretty fantastic. Uh, and I think you answered my next question, but, you know, this hyper noisy, busy cloud, multi-cloud landscape, you know, so many options, uh, customers, uh, partners are probably confused about, about choices. Yeah. How, do you, how do you stand out in this noisy landscape? Again, the tech innovation, clearly you've I've touched on that, but what, what else uh, enables you to kind of differentiate yourself in this market? So the, the, for us, and again, Panzura, we're the mesh, we're the fabric mm. that allows you to have, you know, a little bit of cash in your data center and everything else inside the cloud. And as it's as as you need to retrieve data, we tell we use AI to make a mm. smart guess at what you're going to need at the edge and have it there when you need it. Um, so for us, <clears throat> our ability to take help you with that multi-cloud strategy, uh, enabling you to have part of your data in, in Wasabi as backup and some of it in Azure and AI, and then it's all at the edge. Um, there are other tools that are tangential or uh, augment the capabilities even that we provide. And as a smart CTO, you're thinking about how can I squeeze the most value from the cloud? How can I enable my people to do their best work? Mm. Well, First, the first way to do that is to is to make sure they're safe. And a lot of the products or data transfer in and out of cloud isn't the safest, right? And so you have ransomware attacks, you know, you, you have you know encryption, you might even have an exfiltration of data from inside mm. out. And so having tools and platforms. And again, Panzer helps cover down on this, but there are others in the category as well who help cover down on just protecting your overall experience. Once you can sort of breathe and you feel confident that, wow, my, my people, my team, my data are safe, then I think your focus, Evan, it's a really good question you're asking. Your focus shifts to how do I become productive? And, you know, what if instead of it taking an hour to run a workload, I could do that in, you know, in, in minutes. And, and then what does that do to my staffing model? What does that do to my, you know, optimization of services model? There's a lot of questions you, could, you can begin to ask. 
And then, and then if you answer those questions, it's a matter of then just plugging in the right cloud. You might find that, you know, I can use, I can use a, a, a local, you know, data center cloud from a, from a bar. I can buy clouds from AWS or Azure or Google, and they can satisfy my basic requests. Um, it, it, it's about understanding your long-term goal or even, even your medium-term goal. What are you trying to accomplish in the near future? And then as you move towards that, just finding a vendor that you believe has those options, you can squeeze pricing concessions out of any cloud. They all want to sell you lots of cloud. So you can <laughs> squeeze pricing concessions out of them. But I think being, being taking the time to be sure you know what you want to achieve is that first step in you getting what you want. There's nothing worse, Evan, than going through, and I'm sure you've been in this, uh, these cycles where you spend nine months, 12 months, 15 months evaluating cloud, cloud services, cloud providers. Mm -hmm. You get the cloud, you lock in, you sign a contract, you start moving data, and then you realize, well, this is wonderful cloud, but this isn't what we need, right? And so if you can start with what you need and where you want to go, uh, and then bolt on a cloud, I think you'll find that your success rate is much higher than everyone else around you. Wow, so so well said. Um, well, let's drill down a little bit into the data security side of things. We, we know our, our CSO, CISO, CIO friends are literally uh, losing sleep over the, the challenges around ransomware and, and restoring and protecting data integrity. And um, what, what is your philosophy or your, even your, your real approach here? Maybe give us a peek behind the curtain. Well, used to say, if you get hit by ransomware, do these seven steps, right? And <laughs> it was all if, it was all if. And now it's when, it's now it's when. I think mm. out of you know, 400 plus customers, we've probably had 30 or 40 of them in a year get hit with ransomware, right? Get hit wow. with ransomware solution. So it's not about if, it's it's when. And the smart organizations right now are modeling what that would look like. You're mm. going to take your backups and, you know, ransomware attacks are getting sophisticated. They're timing, you know, that zero day attack. So it's right after you've taken a backup and it can do some corruption that causes you a little extra pain or encryption that, that, that might cause you to actually pay the ransom instead of, uh, of having uh, access to a, a good backup. Mm. But there are some known things that are best practices. One of them is just having an immutable uh, primary storage solution, not immutable secondary storage, but immutable mm. primary storage. If you use a Commvault or any other of the sort of world-class backup solutions that are out there, mm. they'll all provide a, 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 a secondary uh, copy of your data that's immutable. And, and you know, in, in hours, you know, days, weeks, months, quarters, years, you'll have versions of the software. But <clears throat> there are products that uh, you know Panzera has and, and others in our category where your primary solution is also immutable. And, and mm. so as easy as it is when you're in a Word document and you make a mistake and you're like, oh, shoot, I deleted the wrong paragraph, <laughs> control Z, and now it's back, I undo, uh, it can be as simple to do in your file system or in file folders or fo files themselves that might have been, that have been corrupted. So one is just immutability. And the second one is <clears throat> thinking about the speed to restore. So... It used to be in the old days of ransomware, and I'm speaking as if it's been years, but it's months. <laughs> <laughs> in the old days, all three months ago, we would talk about like my data is ransomed and it's locked and I can't get it back and I don't know what to do and business operations are all falling apart. And in today's world, we have backups and we're pressure testing our backups and we're sort of ready to restore, but restoring can, 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 can take days. It's mm. not easy. To restore your files, and so um, again, I, it sounds like I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm pitching Pantera, and I'm not. I'm just pitching a category. Oh, please, we we like pitching here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a category of products out there that that ease your time to restoration, and again, it's the ability to again with an immutable structure, you can say, okay. I now know from an audit trail what has been changed by whom, and I just roll that back. 
add to that the ability to detect any sort of malfeasance by a uh, by by uh, by anyone uh, will help you uh, sort of reduce your your blast radius. Here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, the speed at which malware or ransomware moves, it's incredibly mm. fast, right? You, it goes live and attaches to nodes and all of a sudden explodes and you might have 10,000 files a second being encrypted, something like that. And the ability to, to detect when non-normal behavior is happening, sever the, the, the SMB connections that are causing this bad activity and interdicting a process uh, that would normally corrupt millions of files in minutes. Now you've you've stopped it in 15 seconds. And yes, you might have 150,000, 200,000 files you need to restore, but that's better than trying to restore 300 million files that might have been corrupted in a few minutes. And so um, smart CEOs are saying, okay, it's likely this is going to happen to me. Yes, we're testing our backups. Yes, we're getting ready to restore. But what if I didn't have to restore so much? What if I mm. only had to restore a smaller subset of data because I was able to interdict, spot detect, and, 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 and sort of obviate the risk that comes with a bad actions? And by the way, this is not just a ransomware attack. So much of the time we talk about uh, you know, encryption and, and, and data loss. But a lot of a, a, a lot of the unspoken damage that happens inside of our of our organizations is exfiltration. An employee leaves; uh, they take terabytes of data, sometimes petabytes of data, with them. We know about these things, Evan, when it comes to lawsuits. Um, mm. You know, with when, when you know Uber and Google, they get into a fight about who has auto driving technology from one engineer who left a company and went to another company, all of a sudden, a similar technology that was at company A is now at mm. company B. And then, you know, that calls for a multi-billion dollar sort of lawsuit, sort of shaking the, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the legal scene. But in real life, this happens thousands of times a day where employees mm. are extracting data and leaking it sometimes on purpose because they take, they want to take radical action other times because they just think it's important and they're going to put it on their laptop and that laptop might have some malware on it, or they put it on a phone and that phone's been hacked or, or cracked or something's this, you know, they're, it, it's, it's leaky. And so um, uh, the ability for CTO, CIO, CISOs to, to, to be able to spot non-normal behavior uh, and then shine a light on, is this something I need to interdict or is this just, I need to coach up. Uh, uh, better, better performance for my employees. These, these are so powerful in just maintaining a safe, highly productive workforce. Wow. So well said. Um, one thing you also said, uh, you're using AI today to enhance your cloud storage you know, capability, data management capability. Um, maybe talk a little bit about that. It seems like you've been doing it before. It was uh, cool thing to do in the last year or so. Yeah. So tell us about that and what we can expect next in terms of AI ML related operations. Yeah. So there's, there's a, our, our clients are enterprise. So these are the mm -hmm. largest companies in the world doing some of the most complex uh, work in the world. And not that it's nerdier or more important than what's <laughs> happening in small boutique companies in Silicon Valley. But it's just the fact that these organizations are big and have tens or hundreds of thousands of employees across the world, across many locations. Um, and so we've been we've been applying machine learning to the 12 billion plus snapshots that we uh, are managing at any one time. Right. And wow. At any one time, we're managing some 12 billion plus snapshots. So thinking about that every day, 12 billion snapshots and then tomorrow, 12 billion snapshots. And this continues, continues and continues. And our our theory of the model is that we should be able to know not just um, what is bad. And we spot bad because of of. Cer uh, current behaviors. You might encrypt the header of a PDF, right? Or you might encrypt mm. a file. That's bad behavior. That's known bad behavior. And there's 15 or 16 of these things that are 
glaring red lights. And then there's another 200 that are sort of orange lights that could be bad. And then there's a whole bunch of other behavior. We've been studying this problem uh, from the opposite angle as well, Evan. And I think this is the future of AI. Instead of us looking at what is bad, why aren't Mm. we talking about anything that's not good? Because protecting our employees is just a baseline for doing any work at all. So if we don't if we don't protect our employees, they don't have access to their data 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 systems data tools, and so they can't do any work at all. They're basically looking at a machine that's fully encrypted, and they have nothing they can do. While Yikes. all of our smart nerds are working to help them, right? <laughs> so if we don't protect them, they have nothing. But what we've not begun to dream about, and this is where we our our data scientists are, are creating some innovations that we think will help change the paradigm and provide some potentiality for senior data leaders is what if we were able to help shine a spotlight on anything that's not good? So Mm. we can analyze an organization and say, here's what good looks like. A data engineer does these five things every day. And, um, you know, a software engineer does these 13 things every day in this sequence with this type of file from this location at this time of the day. This is what good looks like. And anything that doesn't line up to it, either at a role level, location level, or even Dan Waltzman, me as a person Mm -hmm. level, doesn't line up to that, I can flag. And then, you know, Evan, as a smart leader, you just decide how many deviations from the norm before you flag it, stop it, counsel me, you know, investigate, or or just start looking around like, man, how could we help Dan do his job better? Um, Mm -hmm. So it's not just spotting bad things and shutting them down. It's not just noticing, hey, Dan's downloading too many things on this day. It's Mm -hmm. going beyond that to say, using AI, man, when Dan's at this location, he works so much faster. Well, why is that? And then I noticed, oh, by the way, he has three times the bandwidth at that location. I wonder Mm -hmm. if I extended bandwidth to my other locations, how would that impact our workforce? And how would we be more productive? And maybe that allows us to squeeze 3% off the bottom line, which is a two and a half billion dollar ad back. And now all of a sudden an expenditure of, you know, hundreds of millions in bandwidth saves us billions of dollars in bottom line productivity. You can begin to build these models that are super exciting, um, but only if you empower uh, your sort of data landscape with a view that I don't think currently, Evan, we're talking a lot about. We're talking a lot about, you know, beating the bad guys and stopping the Mm. bad guys. But what about the good guys, the hundreds of thousands of millions of workers who are, you know, knowledge workers trying to trying to do their best work with data and tools that are insufficient often? That's so well said. Wow. Now you're really talking about uh, uh, team collaboration and communication across boundaries. Uh, you see so much, so many great U.S. companies do a fantastic job of supporting their teams inside the U.S. on our local providers, but not so much outside the U.S. Sometimes they've been second tier, third tier citizens in some ways in terms of collaboration and and tools. So it sounds like that's a common theme. It's a global distributed, geographically distributed network. Um, Talk about some, I don't know if you could mention some of your amazing customers and brands and logos you work with and how they've deployed you, not just in the U.S., but globally. When you think about how um, organizations need to work together, you use the word collaboration a few times, Evan, and uh, distributed, you know, a distributed workforce is just, it's it's where we are right now. Um, and COVID made that distribution really more granular, right? The edge mm. isn't a data center. It's not our office here in Greenville. The edge is right here in my house where I'm working right now, right? That's my edge. Um, and so there's always been this need to have everybody working off the same document, um, sharing a, one document without the need for making, you know, three copies and two, mm-hmm. two low uh, colos and syncing it across mm-hmm. the globe to follow the sun. All of that model, which is sort of the bedrock of our outdated, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you know, data policy, there's been a need for something more and so sophisticated users of Panzera are often just using our technology to allow uh, you know to 
put a little bit of cash at, at an edge, which might be um, a data center. And it might also just be, you know, my iPad it might just be my laptop right here, put a little bit of a cash there and then everything else in the cloud. And I, you know, in something like object store where I can and transfer those uh, objects back and forth highly securely to the edge and serve it up to you right where you need it, which is, um, <clears throat> which is, you know, you know, ne ne next to usually the uh, systems machinery that are that are that are they're pounding on that. What this means is, if you're doing HPC, you could have HPC in four different continents. Maybe a team in the U.S. where engineers are at headquarters working on new designs. A team in India who's doing QA. You might even have a manufacturing facility in in Eng uh, Germany, let's just say, where they're building out sort of the the prototypes. QA, and then you have cloud, because that's where we started this conversation, doing mm. all the high computing. So I need to get data from the US, QA to India, manufactured in Germany, and in I have pick a zone where I'm now going to be doing the HPC in the cloud. And all of that with conventional systems outside of PEDS are, are just not possible. But now having this mesh where someone in India is viewing the same file but you're just streaming the blocks that that aren't at the cache in India and any updates that India makes, only the blocks that have changed get transferred to the United States and vice versa to Germany. You've now got this, this web, this mesh, where you're, you're quickly, quickly able to iterate on changes. Everybody gets exactly what they need just in time uh, for 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 their data purposes, and boy, does it just accelerate um, in time to innovation, time to value for their customers, right? Allowing them to produce better products um, with higher quality, right? Because making a pro making a product that reaches the world, what we all use and consume, you know, if you have more time to QA, more time to pressure test user acceptance, all of that, more time for those things, you get a better quality of product. Fantastic. That's so exciting. So, you know, tell us, I'm, I'm sure you have a very long and probably somewhat proprietary roadmap into the future, but what can you share with us on the future development, either on your end, maybe a peek into your roadmap or on the cloud side, what do you see as the most urgent, interesting uh, uh, development that you're excited for? There's, there's a couple of things that, uh, that that I'm excited for. Some of them we're not actually working on. I'm just observing in the marketplace. <laughs> for Panzura, for, for this year, there's two big themes for us, Evan. It's stability and performance. Again, our mm. customers are, are the biggest, most doing the most sort of complex work in the world. And it, stability is what they count on. Foundationally, rock solid, doesn't break. Uh, and 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 is smart enough to adapt to the needs of the customer. Performance is about speed. It's about integrity of data flow. And so those those are our themes. They will continue to be our themes. Um, some of the things I'm seeing out in the marketplace is, you know, we think about AI around, you know, like maybe the chat GPTs of the world. I start a sentence, it finishes a sentence. I talk to it, it mm. talks back. Those are neat. Some of the things that, that I see out there is just using AI to... Uh, look at data sets and inform, right? What's in a folder? Pointing AI at a folder and saying, what is in this folder? Maybe using it for uh, M&A, Evan. It's like, hey, uh, I'm buying mm. this company. I'm obviously assuming liability um, for, for a lot of these things. How do, I, uh, how do I combine all these things together, right, into a, uh, all this knowledge together into a risk assessment, right? And just boom. I pop, I throw, I, I throw AI at a folder of documents and it returns to me those. Wow. That I'm so I, I see some exciting things out there uh, in the AI world, machine le learning world. And I'm excited to see how some of these things evolve. Um, it, it, it does demonstrate the ability to help us do our jobs better. Wow. That's a great bottom line. Um, so tell us, change is hard. Uh, it's it's painful. <laughs> uh, how do you recommend uh, to a new or potential client what, to get started? What's that initial step, either internally or with you know people like Penzora, um, you know, doing things differently, not just doing what you've always done, which is the easiest path, of course, to take. 
Um, this is probably the foundational question episode. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you're asking about this. I think it's just start the conversation, set the bar low. The bar does not need to be moving to the cloud. The bar yeah. does not need to be, we're changing, you know, everyone loves <laughs> change, right? change management, you know. It doesn't need to be that. I think the first step that I've seen be the most successful is starting the conversation. And 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 then uh, this is going to sound perhaps overly simplistic, but it's continuing the conversation. So once at the leader, you start the conversation, and certainly organizations like us, your the a var that you trust is a is another great option for you. The cloud providers themselves also great uh, for for these sort of conversations. Once you understand your optionality, what's possible. Then Mm. you can begin to start enrolling other people inside your organization into the conversation. It may be that the chief data officer starts it. You bring a CTO, a CISO, maybe a a head of uh, support or professional services. You're bringing them into this conversation. And then you can get other perspectives that inform what you ultimately need from the cloud. I, I think one of the mistakes that I see, um, it's, it's a sort of this unnecessary collateral damage is, is you set the bar so high. We're moving to the cloud. It's going to happen in six months and nothing's going to stop us. Yeah. And, you know, none of us know what we don't know. So mm. just if you have the conversation, begin to think about optionality, all of a sudden uh, you're going to be able to have sort of an enriched experience where you can you can then decide what's appropriate speed sp- and, and spend. Uh, for going forward. Well, that was certainly a mic drop moment. So I appreciate that as we wrap up. Last question here. You've been on the road uh, pretty much everywhere all at once the last few weeks. What's next? Do you have a bit of a downtime or do you have anything else you're looking forward to over the next month or two? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited by Panzerian stepping up and leading the industry in this discussion around, uh, you know, both uh, you know, obviating the risks around cost and security in cloud. Uh, so I'm excited to see us grow. Uh, but uh, no, I'm sh- look on a personal note. I love being home, spending time with the kids, uh, <laughs> and uh, just being a, a human uh, within a pair of running <laughs> shoes on the trail. So I'm excited. All right. Well, wonderful to speak with you. Thanks so much. As a thought leader, it's been incredibly informative and uh, so insightful. And thanks everyone for watching. Reach out and. Uh, with any comments, questions, clarifications. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Dan. Thanks so much. Thanks, Evan. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.